I'm Brady Wright, also known as the Tracy Morgan of Comotion Labs. Uh, if you joined us before, you know that Comotion Labs is the University of Washington's effort around startup incubation. We operate three incubators here on campus, hardware, life science, and a startup tech incubator called Startup Hall. We don't take equity in our startups, and we don't want any of your IP. We just want to help our startups succeed. Here in the hardware incubator, we have a bunch of 3D printers, including resin and FDM, a whole circuitry and solder setup, a reflow oven, CNC, laser cutters, and a ton of tools. We also have relationships across campus with the hardcore machine shops and 3D printing shops. So if we don't have some of the capabilities you need, we probably know someone who does. We also recently installed a 5G network in our space with millimeter wave, ultra wideband, and narrowband 5G. So we're ready to start working with startups innovating in the 5G space, anyone doing advanced sensors and more. I currently have two benches available for a new startup. So please give me a shout if you're looking for a home for your hardware startup. While we wait for everyone to join us, I'll make a few announcements. Next week, we'll be hearing from Jennifer Eby and Walter Tobin, who will present Navigating a Broken Supply Chain, Electronics, and Hardware. All of our fundamentals for startups presentations are archived on our Comotion website under innovation training videos, and we've covered a variety of topics over the past several years. So if you find yourself with some free time, check out our past talks. For our full schedule and to register for future fundamentals, please visit our website, comotionlabs.com, and click on the fundamentals link. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell. And lastly, Fundamentals for Startups is funded in part by a grant from the Economic Development Agency. We will be dropping a link in the chat to a short survey. Please do fill that out. We are right now rewriting that grant so they will give us more money so we can keep doing this and this data keeps them happy. Okay, so today, AJ Pepper is here to present Building Hardware with Paws, creating a technical startup from a non-technical founder perspective. AJ holds a PhD in educational leadership from the University of Oregon. In the first part of his 12-year career, AJ was the VP of Client Success at a digital marketing agency, where he was responsible for business development and leading engagements with large technology companies across strategy, sales enablement, executive coaching, and keynote writing. Currently, AJ serves as the founder and CEO of Command Site, a company focused on bridging human and animal communication. In this role, AJ has raised private equity funds, secured multiple government contracts, and been awarded multiple patents for research efforts on Command Site's K9 head mounted display. AJ will take questions via the chat. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation, and I will now turn the event over to AJ. Hey, Brady. Well, first, just want to thank you and the rest of the UW and Comotion Labs community for having me on. I always love talking about this. Anytime I can get a chance to talk about my dog is time well spent. So uh, thank you for having me and for everyone for uh, chiming in or uh, tuning in to listen. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about Command Site and talk a little bit more about the, uh, say, the administrative side of Command Site, and really how someone like myself has gone from uh, as a non-technical founder, uh, building a very uh, te technical uh, company in a in a vertical and industry that uh, is something I also had no previous experience with uh, law enforcement and military. So, just as a little bit of background, and of course, any chance for uh, if I'm presenting to UW and I can throw a bunch of Oregon logos up there, I'm gonna do it. Uh, but just as some background, so I uh, University of Oregon through and through uh, did undergrad and grad school there, uh, as Brady mentioned, completing my PhD in 2007 in educational leadership. And as a fun note, when I got done with my PhD, I took the, my dissertation to a, a store to get it bound. And the woman looked at it, looked up at me and just said, oh, a glutton for punishment, are we? And so when I say I'm not technical, I'm, I'm probably stubborn at best, which is I think what you need a lot of uh, in order to uh, complete a PhD and also to, to get through a, a startup venture. After the University of Oregon, I went and worked for a marketing technology company by the name of Extreme Arts and Sciences. They're still around doing great things. And my work there really focused on uh, business development. So by the time I left the company, most of the company revenue was, was being generated and run through me. And then as Brady mentioned, I was also doing a lot of keynote writing for executives at Microsoft and Adobe, uh, doing things like uh, sales enablement, sales training doing videos and, and stuff like that. And there was some technical work doing uh, being done there, but I wasn't the one doing it. I had a full development team who was the one implementing it. So I did get to learn some as I went, but uh, as I always told those guys then, I couldn't code myself out of a paper bag. So please don't ask me to do that. And, uh, but just to show that I, I am not technical, I, I, have, I have had some experience in the technical realm, but uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't consider myself technical. And so, 
as I as I got through uh, working uh, at Extreme Arts and Sciences, I was also a big dog lover. And uh, as you can see here, this is my dog Mater. Uh, for the last uh, ten or twelve years, I've participated in a sport called Schutzen, which a lot of people uh, on the military and law enforcement side use as a precursor uh, for dogs that go into military and law enforcement service. And more than anything, this is just uh, one gratuitous attempt to show lots of pictures of my dog. On the top left here, that's him actually falling asleep on me uh, the other day. And I may or may not have curled his lips up uh, to make him look a little bit weird, but he was in fact asleep uh, when I did that. But just a bunch of different uh, uh, pictures and images of, of, of him. But really that's where my, my passion is. And that's where my passion lies. And as I was thinking about uh, what I wanted to do as a, as a next career step. I had done all this time uh, really on the corporate side, doing a lot of uh, marketing communications, organizational development work, and then also doing all these all this work with the dogs. Uh, I was trying to figure out a way in which, how could I bridge a lot of the work I was doing on the corporate tech side with the work that I really wanted to continue to do with, with my animals, or with my dog Mater. And what ended up happening was uh, this vision of bridging human and animal communication. And this notion and this idea of, well, what if I could communicate with Mater in a way in which he could better understand? It's one thing to say good boy. It's one thing to give him a treat. It's one thing to give him a pat on the head. But innately, does he, does he actually understand that? Does he actually know what's going on? And so this notion of, can I, un, can I communicate with him in a way in which he could un, really understand? And then conversely, it, would there be a way in which Mater could communicate with me in which I could take action? So... I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm angry, I'm sad. You know, things when we start thinking about mapping canine cognition, how can we do that in such a way in which Mater can just innately communicate these things to me? And as an owner, as a, as a dog lover, there's something that I could do to take action on it. And so this idea and this vision around vision, human and animal communication really uh, came to a juncture between the, the tech, the corporate tech work I had been doing and the, the, the training I had been doing uh, with dogs for the last you know, 10 or 12 years. And so now that I had this vision, I had this idea, I had this thing that I wanted to make manifest and, and, and come to fruition, I had to figure out, well, I, <laughs> I need a problem to solve. Uh, it's one thing to just go to, go to market with a, with a product and find a problem, but I really wanted to start with understanding, well, where are the challenges now? What, what, what could I help solve for? And some of the problems that we identified and some of the great work that our military and law enforcement are doing was around how they communicated with their animals in the field in what they would call non-line of sight command and control. So they've got a dog downrange, uh, anywhere from 50 yards to a kilometer. And, and how are they communicating with that dog? And it turns out there's a lot of challenges uh, with how they do that. Now, the one challenge is just verbal constraints. And so if they're trying to talk to a dog downrange and they say, hey, spot, look left, well, to what degree does left actually mean anything to the dog? Uh, so there's just a lot of inherent challenges when trying to talk to an animal downrange, when there's lack, lack of shared values, lack of shared culture. Uh, how, how do we actually communicate to those dogs verbally? So it just created issues around potentially having increased time to complete a, complete a mission, sometimes the mission not being able to be completed because the dog just didn't understand what the verbal commands meant. And so just, again, a lot of challenges around uh, verbal communication. Uh, the way they solve for some of that is with some physical commands. And so you can put a dog out in space and just use hand commands. If anyone's ever trained or trialed a field animal or field dog, uh, you can use hand commands and the dog knows to go somewhere based on where you're pointing. But again, that lacks an inherent level of specificity. You're just pointing left. Does left mean go to the trash can? Does it mean go to the car? What does that mean? And as an operator on the military side, if I'm walking down a street in a contested environment, and I'm just using hand signals. Well, now me as the <clears throat> as the operator, I'm completely out in the open. So there's a lot of safety issues related to using uh, more of these physical uh, means to uh, communicate with the dog. And ultimately, a lot of these things just lack an inherent level of specificity. So going left, uh, using hand commands, uh, there's just inherent lack of specificity that the dog doesn't understand that we try to help them generalize with what we mean. Uh, and one way is they did solve for that lack of specificity is using a laser pointer. So an operator can stand at distance, shine a light on a trash can, dog sees it, dog goes. But then back to my point on, on number four, it puts them in harm's way. So now that handler is in line of sight to a potential danger. And as a, someone who's operating in a contested environment, if they're shining a laser 
everywhere, then their whole, uh, their origin, their, their place in the world is gonna be able to be identified by those uh, enemy units that maybe want to do them harm. And so it ends up putting the handlers and the dogs in harm's way by using some of these modalities. And so we understood what the problems were. There's constraints around you know, verbal communication, constraints around what can be done physically, and then constraints around even using things that um, improve specificity, but how could we solve for that? And so what we ended up developing back in, this was back in 2017, was the first ever canine head mounted display or augmented reality for dogs. So, hey, pretty cool. And uh, we've, we've had some success, which is uh, I think why Brady invited me here to talk with a little bit about how we've been able to get so far with working with this group that can sometimes be difficult to penetrate within uh, government contracting. Uh, but we, we've been successful in, in demoing our canine head mounted display to Army Special Operations. Uh, we completed a demo through a grant uh, from the Office of Secretary of Defense back in May uh, to further prove out the technology. Uh, we, and we are currently being funded through the SBIR program. We have a phase two grant through the Army Research Office that kicked off this last September. And we're currently working with those units to help prove out the next version of the system. And then we also have a few other products, which I'm not going to get into today but a few other products that we've put forth to uh, consideration by DOD for funding. And those look like they're gonna be getting uh, funded as well. So been pretty successful and, and pretty happy with the progress we've made as a company. And just over here on the right side, you can see some of the success we've had. Uh, that big picture that you see of Mater, that's the first version in 2017 of the head mounted display that we built. And uh, I believe towards the end of last year, I actually got a text from a buddy who sent me this picture of the Guinness Book of World Records. Apparently we made it into the Guinness Book of World Records, or at least I should say Mater made it into the Guinness Book of World Records, uh, but pretty cool to see that and get recognition for that. And then back in 2020, the Army actually ran an article on the work we've been doing and it got a ton of views, I think over a billion global views uh, for some of that work. And I, I did get some interest across uh, the globe, Netherlands, Australia, Canada, about the work we've been doing. So it's been pretty exciting. Uh, to just get some of the recognition of what we're doing. And then, of course, there's the intellectual property that we've also been able to generate as a result of this work. Uh, myself and my optical engineer uh, have written a few patents, and there's a few other ones pending that aren't listed here. Uh, but been able to make some pretty good traction uh, in terms of uh, the technology that we're building and the groups that we're working with. And uh, pretty really excited to see uh, what comes out of uh, future development efforts. So that's just a little bit about uh, what we've been doing a command site and what we built and happy to take questions on any of the technology and, and what we might be doing uh, in the future. And I think Brady is probably capturing those in the chat, but what I really wanna do is talk about what, help, what helped us get to this point. Uh, as a non-technical founder, when I first had this idea, gosh, I think back May in 2016, I had no idea where to start. I knew HoloLens was a thing, I knew Google Glass was a thing, but I. I, I knew nothing. So it, it's definitely been a challenge and every day has been a really fun learning experience. So back to the title of my presentation, who doesn't love a good pun? Don't be afraid to pause and ask for questions. So pause up. This was one of the first lessons I learned as a non-technical founder. And I think it's one of the hard ones any founder has is not running a million miles per hour every day, getting stuff done, but being willing to take a step back and pause and pause and see, are we doing the right thing? Are we attacking the problem in the right way? We don't need to build something every day and get something out every day, but really taking that moment to understand your customer, the problem set, and everything else that's uh, surrounding your business. And there's a few uh, lessons that I've learned uh, over the last couple of years that I'll, I'll talk about here that <laughs> illustrate that need to take a, a quick pause. So the, the first lesson was when we had started out, and I had this big grandiose idea to create a canine augmented reality system. And I was speaking with engineers about what we would need to do in order to prove it out. Uh, I, I got a roughly a quarter million dollar price tag. I said, AJ, in order to build what you wanna build and demo it so that you can go get future funding, it's gonna cost you about a quarter million dollars. And me not knowing anything said, all right, well, that's a lot of money, but sure, let's do it. Let's find a quarter million. And as a first time founder, and hardware working in the military space, it is quite difficult to find money. And we did not raise that 250, we raised a smaller amount. But the saving grace uh, for that is when I actually went and just as I was struggling to raise funds, and I actually went back to my customers and said, look, we're trying to build this system that's gonna be able to do X, Y, Z. 
And how does that line up with what you'd want to see? They actually just said, AJ, yes, you will need to build that at some point. But the first and fundamental thing that we want to know that we need to be proven and sold on is the fact that a dog can discern and react to a digital indicator. That's it. And we don't need you to do all this spatial recognition. We don't need you to do object detection. We don't need 20 sensors packed on this dog that can do slam. We just need to know that you can put something up in front of a dog, put an indicator on it, the dog sees it, the dog goes. And the least expensive, quickest thing you can do to get us there will be what will be of value to us. And that'll help us promote you to the other entities within DMD for funding. And so quickly that $250,000 project became a lot cheaper. And if I had just kept racing every day to raise all these funds, well, one, I would have raised a lot of money and I would have wasted a lot of money because I would have built something that we would have been, would not have been able to repurpose. And it fundamentally, maybe it would have solved the immediate request of the of DOD, but maybe it wouldn't have. And, and so it could have been a lot of money wasted. So taking that pause, taking that step back, and you're gonna hear me say this a lot through this presentation, talking with your customers, understanding that use case and understanding what they really want can save you a lot of time, a lot of money and a lot of headache. And so the second lesson, uh, which is gonna sound eerily reminiscent of the first lesson is when we started building the next version of the system after we had proven it out in 2017, we had this big grandiose idea again. All right, well, head-mounted display, augmented reality. We know what we need to build. And we just started, you know, that Gordian knot of pulling things and pulling things and understanding, all right, well, we need to put, you know, these cameras and these sensors with these shutters. We need this sort of processing. All of these things we started working through. And all of a sudden you start seeing those, those dollars just flying out the door and going, this isn't sustainable based on the amount of grant that we got, we, we are not going to be able to produce a system that we think we need to build. And so we just halted and I went, uh, flew down to the, to the base and went and spoke with the master trainer, kennel master, and just reset expectations and said, Hey, here's what we think we're building. And, uh, and talking with them, they said, again, yes, this is what you need to build in the future, but here are the training scenarios that we actually wanna put the system through, through its paces on. And those training scenarios ended up being very constrained. And they weren't because they didn't wanna do the bigger stuff, but for them, training, especially with an animal, it's incremental. They're not gonna be able to just throw the dog out in the, into the wild and say, all right, go do this. Everything they do also has to be trained on the dog side. And so doing these big, big grandiose mission ideas just doesn't make sense for them because they wanna take an iterative approach with it as well. And so coming back from that meeting, it was just a big aha moment for myself and for my engineers to just go, oh, we now have a discrete set of demo experiences that we need to build for everything from the distance the dog is from the object, how big the object is, the amount of ambient light that's going to be in the room. All these things were able to get quantified and then packaged into a specification sheet. And if, again, if we had just kept going with this big idea that we thought DOD wanted us to build, we would have ran out of time, run out of money, and we would have had some pissed off customers. And so it was a great thing for all of us to just take that pause, take that step back, again, validate these expectations with customers, and it allowed us to uh, deliver something that they were enthusiastic about, even though they obviously could never feel it. And as I went through these lessons, and I listened to uh, Harinder Paul last week when he was talking about uh, his speech on going from cubicle to co-founder, uh, you know, he said disruptions don't start with a fully featured product. It really is an iterative approach, and when, especially with hardware, because you have all this investment up front in building hardware, and you can't take that back. That money's there. Whereas with software, it's much more easy to adjust and adjust on the fly. Hardware is an investment. And so when you think about any sort of hardware project, finding those iterative approaches to build slowly and build smartly uh, become really important. I'd also add, AJ, that that sounds like you had a good customer there as well that, that understood the iterative, uh, the iterative approach to hardware building. I think that it would be possible to find yourself you know, with a customer that maybe has a willingness and ability to pay, but maybe doesn't understand that aspect of hardware entrepreneurship. And it worked nicely because that's how dog training works too, right? <laughs> yeah. um, that's, that, that, that's good. And maybe there's a lesson there for folks as well as you know, make sure that your customer understands how this works because um, if they had those expectations that you deliver a fully functional um, communication device for, for dogs all in one go, um, that's pretty tough to, tough to live up to. 
It, it is, and, and it'll get to a point I'll make in a few slides, but it really it comes down to these testable questions that uh, you can throw out there. So, you know, do you want a dog to be able to discern between, you know, three active people in a field 100 yards away? And, and writing down some of these questions that you want to test against, what, you know, for me, those are my scenarios, whatever, whoever else is out there building hardware, what are those really small, discrete, testable questions you can answer or ask and answer? Uh, are really how I've started to really think about hardware development is finding those test scenarios because that's what helps us understand what needs to get built and the cadence with which things need to get built. And that's a perfect segue. We just had a question from uh, Spicer asking if you could elaborate on what you envisioned uh, in lesson one versus what you ended up creating and reevaluating what you left for later. So I guess, could you give an example of, of one or two of the tests that the second version of product version one um, actually ended up uh, ended up running and, and ended up teaching folks? So for the for the first version we built in 2017, my my expectation was we were going to have to put this system on a dog. The dog's going to have to be out in an open field and there's going to be three figurants, so three quote unquote suspects that are sitting out in a field. And through a remote device, I would have to be able to touch a screen and have it highlight one of those people. And the dog would see who's being highlighted and the dog would go, I'll say, attend to that person. And if you can imagine, there's a lot of different camera technology that's required for that, a lot of different object tracking, a lot of different um, uh, computer vision, a lot of image processing, latency stuff. There's a lot of stuff that would get packaged into that first yeah. system and me not being a, a, a technical person I was like, yeah, I mean, I have a phone. It happens all the time. Like, why not? Let's do it. And what we ended up building because that was very difficult was, uh, and it, actually I'll, I'll go back here. Uh, this picture that you see of my dog Mater, that was the first version we built. And it was very stripped down from that original vision. And the, the system was completely wired. And so it had HDMI, USB, about a three foot cable that would go to my laptop. And from there, I had a user interface on my laptop. And then I, I was able to put objects in front of Mater. So he would be in a, a down stay in front of me. I would put objects in front of him. And through the UI on my computer, I would just highlight one of those boxes using the UI. And then I would say, Mater, show me. And he would go and he would attend to it. So there was about a three foot radius in which he could operate versus this 50 yard radius I thought I was going to have to build for. And so we really paired it back. And for me, that was a testament to answering the question, can a dog discern and react to a digital indicator? You don't need to send them to take, you know, take somebody out. It's as simply as them having that behavioral moment of changing their focus, changing the way they're moving the body, changing what they're doing in that small little environment that was far and away enough to prove out that yes, this technology would work. And if I can hop on there, you know, that's, I love that this whole first generation of the product design was just to verify a few assumptions, right? That were key assumptions that need to be proven. And I know that you weren't in a context where you were going out and trying to raise you know, get this done so you can raise a pre-seed, prove this so you can raise an A and, and so on and so on. But that is kind of how that works, right? For hardware development is you don't have to have the whole thing at once. You can prove a couple of assumptions with an early version that doesn't look anything like it's going to look and just show that, hey, this is technically feasible. This is, um, this is possible to do. In your case, we can get a dog to respond to um, virtual images. You don't have to build the headset. Yeah, and that was the questions I got from investors and from people on the DOD side were, there was a lot of people who just, yeah, knew that, AJ, I believe you, this would work. But the key people, especially on the DOD side, said, AJ, I don't believe a dog can discern and react to this digital indicator. And so we said, all right, well, there's our testable assumption. Let's get that solved. And once we have that solved, that helps getting uh, funding and everything else from DOD a lot, a lot easier. All right, so then the next lesson I learned is uh, not all money is good money. And this is, I think, one of the toughest things for any founder to hear and listen and grok is because we always need money. Uh, there's never a moment where I'm not thinking, where am I going to be able to get my next grant, my next investment? And it's tough. But the people, especially early on, that you bring into your company 
uh, they, on some, I, I view them as family. And so all of the angel investors that I have, I could call them right now, fly to go meet them, go grab dinner with them. Oftentimes, a lot of them will just call me out of the blue and don't even want to talk about the company. They just want to know, hey, AJ, how are you? How are you feeling? What's going on in your life? And we'll talk about friends, family, and all that sort of stuff. And having those sort of people who are there to back you and support you are incredibly important because the path to success is all sorts of weird ways. It's never a straight line. And there was a, a, a person that early on wanted to come in and, and fund the company. He was going to give me that quarter million dollar check to build that system that I thought I needed. And I brought that person in, brought in some folks from DOD to meet him. And because he wanted to meet with customers, which seemed all like a reasonable thing. Yeah, sure. You want to make sure whatever I'm proposing is something that somebody actually wants and brought him in. And this guy managed to piss off a, a room full of special operators. And I mean, they've got pretty thick skin and he managed to piss them off and got done with the meeting. I debriefed with the spec ops guys and I went and, and debriefed with this gentleman and he was willing to write, write me a check to get the company off the ground. And I just could not in good conscience take his money. I, just, I couldn't take his money. The people that I was working to support, the people that I was working to help save their life when they're out in the field, didn't like this guy. And sure, I would have could have got his money, but it would have, I, I think it would have sacrificed a lot of my own morals uh, in order to take that money. And so I didn't. And turns out it was probably one of the best things that happened to me because had I taken his money, I would have been stuck with this guy who would have been just writing me every day about where things are at. And then I probably would have built the wrong thing to test that first testable assumption around can a dog discern and react to a digital indicator. And one of the best things from not taking that money is I, I had to run the company really lean. Uh, we, we didn't raise 250, we raised a smaller amount. But by running lean, you really had to become resourceful. And you became resourceful by talking with customers about understanding expectations. You became resourceful around what really constitutes a proof of concept. What are those testable assumptions? And I think because I've had to run the company lean and it's something I continue to promote running the company lean, it really makes us think about what's really important. What are the need to have? What are the must haves? And always trying to meet the need to have with a future towards the must have and including them if we can. But I think that that running the company lean has been one of the best things that we've done because we've got a group of people behind the company that support it no matter what. And they know whatever decision I'm making in terms of the technology, the hiring, the, the, the things I go out and do in the community, it's all going to help build towards this, this vision and nothing's going to waste. And so, again, it's, it's a really hard lesson to learn and, and something that even today I still think, ah, it'd be nice to take some you know, VC funding now. Uh, but I think the, the less money you take, uh, at least for me, that I've taken has probably been a, a real uh, smart thing for me. And again, the people that I brought on board are all people that I cherish and really enjoy uh, and, and am delighted to have as part of the command site team. Which then brings me to my third point around lessons learned. Um, world, meet Ned. This is my optical engineer. Uh, and Ned is awesome. And I can't tell you on this journey you're on, whether it's raising funds, the people you're working with, or just the people who are gonna be there to support you, it's really the people that matter. And especially as a non-technical person starting a technical company, people really matter because you cannot do everything. Like I said, I still cannot code myself out of a paper bag, but I can at least read code now, but people really do matter. And so this is Ned. I met Ned back in 2017 or 2016, 2017, when I, when I just had an idea. And I had been going around trying to figure out who could build this augmented reality system for dogs. And I'm talking to a few engineering firms. I'm talking to a few just contractors, people who are in the space, and probably three or four people. And they had all pitched these ideas to me on how they think they could solve this need to discern and react to a digital indicator. And there's a couple pretty good proposals out there, but Nothing, something just didn't sit, sit right with me with all of them. And I went one night, I think it was probably about six o'clock. I met Ned. It was late. He, he had, uh, said he would stay late to meet with me. My first meeting with him, we, we signed NDAs and, and he says, all right, what do you want to build? And I said, well, I want to build canine augmented reality. And you could just see the wheels turning and him going, what? <laughs> he goes, all right, tell, tell me more, tell me more. 
And so I, I started talking about the use cases. I started talking about the problems that we we're trying to solve. I started talking about what we needed to um, initially build. And I got about 10 to 15 minutes in and he just stopped me, just stopped me cold, went to the whiteboard and drew the, uh, the optical model that he thought would be the most effective, most cost-effective for us to get something out the door. He's like, AJ, this is what you need to build. And it was at that moment, I was like, I found my guy. Because everyone else I had talked to had been running me around in circles. They had given me ideas that didn't meet the criteria and the needs that DOD was really telling me. And this was the first time somebody had come to me and said, AJ, this is what you need to build. This is gonna be most cost-effective. And here now, this, this picture was taken in, gosh, a few months ago at a client site where uh, myself and Ned went to go demo some of the designs that we were putting forth as part of the phase two SBIR. And I said, I needed a meeting room and they said, oh, okay. And they walked us into this busted down building that they used for training and said, well, how's this for a meeting room? And I said, sure. And so here I've got Ned who's stuck by me since 2016, walking him into this meeting room that there's glass everywhere. The, the, some of the windows are busted out, the lights don't work everything is just beat up and here he is not only helping me present to my reps over at the department of defense I always laugh at them like he's actually carrying my bags and so the people you have i can't tell you and i cannot reinforce this so much the people you have around you will help to make or break your company and i consider ned now to be a friend a lot of the folks that i work with uh, i consider now to be friends but he's really been someone that has helped me uh, create the company and gives me a lot of uh, just counseling, consulting on, you know, different ideas. It's like whenever I have a random idea about anything, he's usually the first guy I call and he just talks me through whether it's a good or a bad one, but it really, uh, it comes down to the, the people really matter. And so as you're thinking about building out your teams, as you're thinking about building out your, the, the folks that are going to help fund you really think about, are these the type of people you're going to want to spend potentially every day with for the next five or 10 years? And if you can't say heck yes, then it's probably should be a heck no. So anyway, we'll give a big thank you to Ned. We got we got one question from the oh, yeah. chat asking what some of those red flags are with investors, and I'll also uh, also add in, you know, early employees and co-founders. Are there are there any particular red flags? Is it kind of a feeling thing? Uh, are there things you look for? Yeah. So the and this might sound a little counterintuitive because someone coming to me saying that they want to work with me, I, I'm not Microsoft, I'm not Amazon, I'm not Meta. I don't have money flowing from the ceilings that I could just hand out to people. And I think people who are truly invested in what you're doing, when you start talking to them, the first thing, they don't, they never ask you about how much equity is available or how much you can get paid. They usually come to the idea or they come to the table with ideas. They're usually the folks that have bought into the, the vision of the company. They're usually people that have bought into you individually as a co-founder and they wanna see you succeed. And so I would say the, the red flags are, if you don't see someone that's actually wanting to be a part of the company, either because the vision speaks to something personal to them or they don't have a belief in you, but they're, they're more interested in the equity, the money, whatever is at stake for them. That's been a, always been a flag for me because I want somebody who's gonna be with me because they believe in what we're trying to achieve and just know, yeah, the money stuff's coming. But if that's what you're working for, the money, there's other ways to get money uh, than working through a slog of a hardware startup, startup uh, trying to find funding. So uh, there, there's, uh, I'll get into a little bit of theory here for a minute, but that there's something called the limbic system. That's where your gut, uh, your gut response comes from. If you meet somebody and that gut response is, I don't know, that's your limbic, your Neanderthal brain going, stay away from this person. And it's yeah. worth listening to. Uh, you can rationalize it later, but take a listen to your body, listen to your brain, listen to what all these signals are telling you. If this person's trustworthy, if this person has your best interests in mind, uh, and certainly from a, a more a tangible aspect, if the first thing out of this person's mouth is what equity is involved, how much money mm -hmm. is in it for me, you know they're not in it for the right reasons. Yeah, that's great advice, thanks. So I've talked a lot about don't take the money, <laughs> uh, take pause and listen, uh, people matter. And what I love about this slide is uh, no matter what, we're still in a, I'm still in a technical business. I'm assuming most of you listening are in a, a technical hardware business and you have technical problems that need to get solved. And uh, you've got a technical problem running at you and you still don't know how to solve it. And what I love about this picture is the guy on the right, he's probably one of the top trainers in the world. And this was a number of years ago. 
And I, uh, I'd gone to this seminar. I was just observing. I wasn't uh, participating. And he said, AJ, I want to work your dog. And I said, no, no, it's okay. He goes, I want to do a long bite, which is essentially a, a dog and human running at each other at about a football length field apart. It can, it's spectacular to watch. And I said, no, no. And, and I finally agreed. And, and I said, okay, just keep in mind, like, my dog's not a typical Rottweiler. He's going to come fast. He's going to come hard. Just be ready. And he just kind of shook, shook it off. like, okay, yeah, whatever. And from his perspective, you know, he's probably one of the top trained, talented, uh, we call them helpers in the world. And as you can see on his face here, he wasn't quite expecting the technical problem that was going to come his way. Because uh, usually when you see him catching dogs, he's got a big smile on his face and Mater took him by surprise. And so the, the message here is no matter how technical you get, whether, you know, you're a C++ expert, image processing expert, whatever there might be, there's always going to be a technical problem uh, that's going to throw you off your feet. And there's ways in which, at least for me, uh, I, I don't expect to ever be the world's foremost machine learning expert, but there's certainly ways in which I've gone about addressing my limitations and my lack of knowledge around uh, tech. The first way is uh, I've actually, as much as I can, try to spend as much as time as much as time as I can with customers. And so if you look at this, these two top images that are up here, uh, the one on the right was uh, a group of guys from a local base that brought me to do uh, just a training day uh, downtown Seattle and they're getting ready to demo a building. They brought dogs in and the guy just called me and said, hey, do you just want to see how our dogs work? And I remember at this particular moment, I was stressing out because I, I wasn't sure what to build. I wasn't sure how I was going to build it. I wasn't sure I was going to get the money. And I feel like whenever I've been in that moment where I'm either stressed out, I'm a little down, I can't figure out what to do. There is no better way to spend your time than just sitting with your customer, even if you don't have an agenda. It's just, I just wanna listen to you. I just wanna hear about the problems you're having because you'll go away invigorated and you'll go away with ideas. And so uh, really appreciate these guys having me out for that day. As you can see, it was a rare sunny day in Seattle. And then if anyone ever wants to go do uh, essentially an overnight training uh, with the army, you can get uh, this delicious, tray of chicken carrots and what should be cake over on the left hand side I, again another one of these times where they invited me to go do a training I think that went from about 10 p.m to 4 a.m so I got to stay up all night with them and again for me having no military law enforcement background being able to wear night vision goggles nods going out seeing how the dogs are working in the night seeing how they could apply the technology it was huge and there there wasn't anything I was getting out of that meeting in terms of, you know, getting a, a grant written or getting something submitted. These were just guys who knew that I had a shared vision with them to do amazing things with their canines and help keep the canines safe and them safe as operators. So they invited me out and I jump at the chance at any time I can to just sit with customers. So one of the best things I found is that there's a technical challenge I can't figure out. I don't know how to solve. Actually sitting with customers is a great way to just help ameliorate some of that stress and think about the problem in new ways. The other way in which uh, I've tried to get over my technical hurdle and hump is there's a ton of uh, open course uh, courseware that you can get through. So Coursera, I just recently uh, completed a course, uh, introductory course on Python, and I still don't consider myself a coder, but I was actually sitting with one of my <clears throat> software engineers the other day, and he was opening up his uh, text file, and I could actually look through all of his code and say, oh, I know what that means, and actually found an indent problem one place where his code wasn't working. So that was a big win for me. Uh, but being you said that, you're not technical, right? Hey, hey, just one little one little space can cause all sorts of issues. So, but even stuff like that, just finding uh, you don't need to be a technical expert, but being technically aware, being technically familiar, can allow you to have better conversations with your customers, better conversations with your engineering team. It's something that I'm going to continue to do, whether it's Coursera or anything else, just continuing to get more knowledgeable in some of these areas. And then again, I, I would say the biggest thing you can do to help solve any of your technical challenges is having that person, or having those people who are going to be great sounding boards, great engineers, great people who can put ideas and implement ideas. In my case, it's been Ned and the team that he's helped build around me. Uh, but again, people, people, people are going to be your biggest savior because even if you were a technical founder, you'd still need people around you to help build out whatever you're looking to build. And for me, it's especially important because I, I can't build any of it. So I'm relying on all these people and these people need to have high morals, high, uh, high aptitude in terms of their own ability to develop and just great people to be around. And I feel very lucky that I've, I've been able to found them so, or find them. So the people are going to be really important in, in whatever you decide to do. 
So key areas for success, and these are things that I, I keep in mind all the time as I'm uh, running through uh, what we're building. And uh, first one is just operations, uh, run lean. Everything is gonna be more expensive than you think. So if you get all this money and you hire up a ton of people, buy a bunch of computers, buy a bunch of stuff, you're gonna run out of money pretty soon. And so think about running lean, think about running lean and mean. It's, it's probably one of the best things I think you can do as a hardware startup, because once you're out of money, it's really hard to go find more. Iterate. So again, back to my learning lessons of finding those discrete, testable questions that you can solve for, find answers, prove the technology works and show it to customers is huge. You don't need to build the biggest, baddest product. You need to solve for a discrete need and keep solving those discrete needs and those will add up to a future product. But the best way to develop is just in short cycles with nice testable questions and iterate from there. Break it down to the least common denominator and, and that'll really help you push your product forward. And then I can't say this enough, collect customer feedback anywhere you can get it. It gets buy-in from your customer. They're gonna be your biggest champion. It'll keep you on track. And so if you know what their pain points are and what they're trying to solve for, it'll constantly help you recalibrate whatever you're doing. And in the end of it, it's for me at least, it's invigorating. Working with spec ops, <clears throat> seeing what they're sacrificing in service of our country, uh, in service and uh, what they're sacrificing, you know, with their families, and really the amount of joy that they have working together. It, it's invigorating talking to them about that camaraderie they have, the love they have for the dogs. And so, whether it's something you might be doing with, you know, maybe it's SaaS, maybe it's robotics, wh whatever it might be, it really should be invigorating to talk to your customers. And if it's not invigorating, you might want to question, you know, what you're doing. <clears throat> and then, farm out talent. You don't have to hire everyone right away. That can be a huge overhead cost. So I've run the company at this point using 1099s, 1099s, people I trust. It also allows you to parse things out into small achievable projects, let someone demonstrate that they're competent, capable, and then you can give them the next part of the project. But if you just hire somebody in to come take on a project, you've got that overhead cost. You don't actually know if they can do the work you're wanting them to do, and it's going to cost you a lot of money. So I'm a huge advocate of using 1099 contractors. And then if you need to bring those people in as employees later on. <clears throat> All right, next is finances. So one of the biggest reasons for hardware startup failure is uh, you run out of money. Uh, the second reason is customer fit. And I think those two are really uh, aligned together because if you build something and it's not aligned to your customer fit, you're not gonna have money to go back and realign it. And so one of the biggest things you need to worry about is back to that running lean is think about where you're spending your money, use that money to, to solve for these testable questions and making sure no matter what you're doing is always aligned to whatever your customer pain point is and they're on board with how and what you're solving for. And then <clears throat> just keep in mind, everything costs more. You think a project's gonna cost you $100,000, well, it's probably gonna cost you 120 to 150. I've generally found in all of my builds uh, given our best efforts, things tend to cost about 20% more every time. And the only caveat to that is our first version in 2017, I was actually under budget, uh, which was pretty exciting. And it's almost been the last time. So everything just generally costs more. And especially now, as you think about all of the supply chain issues, uh, I think those NVIDIA Jetsons, you know, used to be about 400 bucks and now they're a thousand dollars. So if you had scoped something out a year ago, well, your costs have doubled since then. So just keep in mind, uh, you want to put that buffer in there because everything will cost more. And a great way to help uh, control for some of those costs are internal versus external employees. Again, we touched on this, but using external employees, I've used Upwork a number of times and have found some incredible engineers in there. And we're able to give them bite-sized pieces of the project so they can they can prove themselves out and then you give them more and more and more. But it's helped us control costs quite a bit. So don't feel like you have to hire everyone right now. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't currently operate with a chief technical officer. Uh, it's just me and I've got a myriad of engineers that I work with that all have technical expertise. At some point I will bring on a CTO, but I've been able to get through getting numerous DOD grants without having a technical person as a founder. So are you the only full-timer on the whole team? Uh, just me and Mater, who's snoring back there somewhere. Amazing. And then <clears throat> the last piece is when you're thinking about the company, really think about iterating 
and thinking about scaling for tomorrow. I think a lot of people get into this notion that I've got to think scale, scale, scale. But if you don't have a product that is meeting customer needs today, if you don't have a good relationship, scaling, scaling today doesn't do you any good. So think about that iteration process today and then keep in mind that you will need to scale in the future, but don't let that be the burden to getting, uh, getting something built, getting something done and, and demo to a customer. Partner relationships are huge. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, Ned and some of the other engineers that I've worked with, some of the, the uh, contract manufacturers that I've worked with, everything to me is, is an interview. So whether it's the up people on Upwork, I'm looking at all these folks as people that might be potential employees down the road, people that I wanna work with as the company does begin to scale. And so as you think about bringing people on, Think about it, it's an interview process for them as much as it is for you. They're going to be looking to see if they want to work with you as well. And so think about that and have that idea in your head as you're, as you're working with folks. And then understand your cost of goods sold and market numbers and then understand them again. Uh, when you start getting to the point of wanting to get VC money, wanting to scale, these are going to be the questions that they're going to ask you. You know, what are your cost of goods sold? What are your, what's your total addressable market? And so I'm constantly thinking about as, especially if we ask fluctuations in supply chain, how are my cost of goods sold being changed? What are my market numbers? Those, those aren't gonna change as much, but you need as a founder to have these numbers relatively off the top of your head so that as you're talking with people, whether you just bump into them in the proverbial elevator or you're putting a pitch deck together, that these numbers are part of your business understanding because it really is important for how you think about growing your business and, to some extent, if your business is going to be viable, if your cost of goods sold are going to be 90% of your uh, total gross, maybe this isn't a good business to get into. So evaluating that constantly, because there is also the decision of walking away from something at some point if the numbers just aren't there to support the business model. And with that, that's what I got. What a good pop there on the screen. <laughs> Love to see it. Um, gr gratuitous use of Mater anywhere. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look at look at Mater. Um, so uh, another question uh, that came in is, and you spoke to this a little bit when you were talking about internal versus external hires, but basically, <clears throat> how do you find your engineers? Um, say you had to go and say you needed a mechanical engineer for a part of your build coming up. What would your process be to find that person? Sure. So. I'd go about it in a, in a few different ways. So right now, because I'm, I'm sort of steeped in the process and I have access mm -hmm. to some engineers, some of the things I would do is, is one, look for recommendations. So does anyone I work with currently have some they might recommend? But when I was starting out and I had nobody, I, I LinkedIn was my thing. I sent so many cold emails to so many people and a lot of people responded and a lot of people didn't. Sure. But that's, that's how I would... That's how I went about it. And uh, when, you, when you're crafting those messages, there is something to be said about having a good hook because a lot of these people mm -hmm. are getting hit up with messages all the time. Luckily for me, if I talk about doing canine augmented reality, people are at least like, what, huh? And it's, it's a yeah. good hook for me. But finding that differentiator for yourself that you can put into a cold email to grab somebody's attention so that they're at least willing to listen or maybe shoot your recommendation. But the biggest thing, I, I always use LinkedIn. I'm on there almost every day looking mm -hmm. for different resources. Uh, another place, good place to do it is Upwork. There's great talent yeah. that's on Upwork. And if you look at some of the some of the products that maybe you really enjoy, you know, for me, it's HoloLens or any sort of those DOD oriented products. I'll look for mechanical engineers that worked on those projects on LinkedIn or elsewhere to see if I can at least get them to talk to me because they're going to know people in their network uh, that may have availability and cycles to work for you. Sure. Um, and so now, so now you're running this with pretty much outsourcing everything to consultants. Have you done a, have you modeled out to see what you, how much money you're saving by doing that on a monthly basis rather than having you know, two full-time engineers on board or whatever it would take? Uh, I, I haven't modeled that. Uh, I've, I actually do have now employees on staff because as part of the SBIR program, that program okay. is built to uh, support small businesses and grow small businesses. But even those employees, they, so again, back to the people, the people that I brought on board were previously contractors and they had their own company. Yeah. They willingly came on board as, um, as employees being paid through payroll 
because they believe in the company, they believe in me, and they wanted to continue to be part of the process. And so it, it'd be a pretty easy model to say, you know, if, for instance, these two people are easily one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand uh, dollar type salary people, mm -hmm. and if I had to pay that over the course of a year, that's a big chunk of change. Yeah. And right now I modulate it. So some weeks, maybe they're only doing 10 hours. When we start getting deep into the, some of the builds, you know, it's not unreasonable to see them put in 50, but yeah. I'm able to control for that based on where we're at in the process. And because they have other clients that they're working on, they're not banging down my door saying, AJ, where's my 40 hours yeah. this week? They're able to modulate pretty well. Great. Um, so one thing that I kept thinking about when you were talking, you spoke a lot about talking to customers, talking about the canine handlers, the trainers, um, the big issue there, though, is is that's not your only user. I mean, one of your users you cannot communicate with, and that's the whole point of the company, right? So how do you, how much harder does that get when one of your users isn't able to communicate um, what they need, what they're getting, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense? And, and I guess, how do you navigate that, having essentially a, a, a user that can't help you develop your product? Yeah, so having a dog as the end user is is a challenge because they can't give me a you know pause up, pause down if something is <laughs> if something is working. And so for me, it's it's been a, a couple of steps. One is fundamentally every everything we do. Well, I'll just say this: everything we do, what I do with Mater, it's it's non invasive, it's safe, everything mm -hmm. is uh, reward positive. So everything he he lives for Texas toast. So he does basically everything on his own volition uh, with the expectation that I'm gonna feed him a bunch of kibble or Texas toast when he gets done. But the, the foundation for all of that is really, for me, it's been good training so that he can indicate to me if something is working and if something is not working just simply by the way he, his behavioral response. And so that's one way is just the fundamental training is you have to be very thoughtful in how you train the animal and how you're asking them to do something so that's one piece of it. And then how you build the tech is also uh, super important. So as I talk to my optical engineer and I say, hey, we want to build this system where we're you know, projecting these images to the dog. How do we know if they're looking at it? How do they know if we can see it? And so there's ways in which you can build you know, things uh, into the technology to, to basically correlate that, yes, the dog should be able to see it. Uh, there's things in which you can project onto the eye that at least shows that it's on the pupil. Uh, so that you know it should be visible to the dog. So there's, bless you. So there's some of these things. Uh, there's some of these things that you can build in the tech, but but it, it's tough because if if the system fails for whatever reason, you have to figure out, is it a training failure or is it a hardware failure? And you have to be able to uh, problem solve on both sides. And it, it, it can be tough and it certainly extends how much time we spend either on the training or on the development side, because you have to be able to mitigate both. Are you, are you having to do any sort of anatomical research about how dogs' eyes work? I mean, it seems like there's some unanswered questions, unanswered questions there possibly as well, where you need, you know, biologists and veterinarians and things. <laughs> yeah, so the, some of the fun part of this is we've had to do some morphological studies on canine heads and understanding you know, general head sizes, IPD, interpupillary distance, mm -hmm. uh, ophthalmologically, what can they see, what can't they see? Uh, field of view, binocular field of view. Some of these data are available. We do have an ophthalmologist that we work with out of um, down in California that he's written studies on a lot of stuff. So when we have some of these more specific questions, uh, we're able to go to him and ask him and his team. Uh, and then we, we are going around doing a lot of 3D scanning. So uh, getting 3D models built because the important part for us not only are the hard structures, the skull, the skeleton, but then also mm -hmm. all the soft tissue and the hair, uh, the iris, the pupil, the re all this sort of stuff uh, becomes really important. So we need a model that has all of that so that my engineers can model it. So there is there is some primary research going on, uh, both from in-house and then also working with universities to understand mm -hmm. how a dog perceives, how a dog sees. Okay. So we have the, the use case you're working on now, but when you are thinking about what's 10, 15 years down the road when Command Side is a remarkably successful, ubiquitous company. Like, what does that blue sky look like? Are these, uh, are there entertainment applications for dogs, keeping your dogs happy? Are we now communicating with a wider variety of animals beyond dogs? Like, what do you, what do you see as, as, the, as the big blue sky opportunities here? 
Yeah, so for, for me, the, the big opportunity, and, and I think we've seen Elon Musk do a little bit of it with his Neuralink and implanting that chip into the into a pig brain. I don't know that I want to go that far, but but I any good dog trainer behaviorist will will tell you that these dogs are giving off physical markers that indicate stress, happiness, joy, hunger, mm -hmm. and I feel like the right sensor package put on a dog non-invasively uh, can actually map some of those. And so from a canine perspective, I think we can map canine cognition, emotion, and behavior and intermediate that with technology so that it's meaningful for us as a handler. And then bi-directionally, we can communicate back to the dog through a user interface that would allow them to experience you know, levels of joy, whatever happiness that we want to actually communicate back to the dog. So from a future point of view, that's that's the goal of the company is this bi-directional communication between human and dog. And then there's no reason why that has to stop at the canine. Uh, I'm not a big cat person. Sorry for those out there that are cat people. Uh, but there's no reason why you couldn't try to make your cat a little happier too. Uh, and even when you're trying to communicate with horses, cows, and the, the, the general um, or, or wider animal kingdom. Uh, but for me, it really is thinking about bridging human animal communication intermediated through technology. I'm trying not to take shots at cats here. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the questions that uh, that uh, my my boss really likes to ask people when she talks to him is, "What are you reading or listening to these days?" Oh man, uh, okay. So uh, the last book I read was Atomic Habits by James Clear. Okay, and that's a really great book. Uh, probably put under the, the, the umbrella of self-help, but it really helps yep. break down these notions of habit stacking, how to create good habits, how to break bad habits. And it's a really helpful thing, especially I think as a founder, you can get into some bad habits, sleeping late, getting up, yeah. super, whatever that might be. Uh, those those books, or that book was uh, really helpful for me. Uh, the Hidden Brain from Shankar Vedathan. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to mess up his last name. I apologize. That's a great podcast and just talking more about social sciences, how the brain works. Uh, and I, I think he's had some incredible insights that I've even taken into some of my day-to-day -day work, working with different types of people. And so I'd say between those two, those are my, those are my two that I've, I've been active with. Uh, last question before uh, we let you tell Mater how good of a boy he is. Um, uh, for the folks, so if anybody doesn't know this, we have um, members both in this hardware incubator and in our life science incubator here in Flu Call, and they actually get together and, and watch this in person on Fridays. And there was a question in the lab of if Mater will come visit us at Flu Call and say hello. Uh, Mater would uh, be delighted to come visit. He is a bit of a bull in a china shop, so if you don't want anything broken, I suggest to put it up high. Uh, but he will happily uh, come lick your face, and if you would like, also bite you. Uh, but that. Can <laughs> Your that's an option yeah, yeah that's sure. an option <laughs> all right aj I, I really appreciate this this was a this is a great talk um i don't know anybody else that's innovating in this way around kind of the animal space um super exciting very interesting problem area and wonderful to hear from a non-technical founder i mean this the, the the problems that you're taking on the problems that most of our members are taking on are big hairy tough things and it's great to hear that it is possible to innovate in the space and to have success from a non-technical point of view so thank you for joining thanks for having me uh next week as a reminder at noon on friday we'll be hearing from jennifer eby who i'm sure is in the chat right now uh, and walter coven who will present navigating a broken supply chain electronics and hardware um obviously a big issue right now in the last few years uh so please sign up for that we'll see you all next week and thank you all for tuning in we'll talk to you soon Thank you.